everyone such a blessing to be in the house of the lord on this beautiful beautiful morning a little chilly but it's still a beautiful day beautiful um others are going to be coming in and i'm gonna try to remember to make this announcement at the end but for those that are coming in let's remind them start next sunday we're going to be back downstairs in the um hispanic ministries sanctuary and those who may have a few minutes that can help um, stay behind. We just want to make sure we clean it up for Mary Good and everything. So we will be doing that next Sunday. So I know some people will be glad to hear that since the stairs. <laughs> Sometimes it's a challenge. Good morning. Y'all color coordinated today. Don't that look nice? <laughs> uh, I was just letting them know that starting next Sunday, we'll be back downstairs in the Hispanic ministry. We won't be back up here. We'll be downstairs. Hmm? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. All, right. All right, well, we're going to open up with prayer. Does anyone have any prayer requests? Any prayer needs? All right, I'm going to ask everybody to stand. We'll just go to the Lord together. Get Miss Betty before she sit down, then have to stand right back up. All right, thank you. <laughs> Let's just go to the Lord this morning. Lord, we just thank you for this beautiful day that you've given to us. We thank you, Lord, for allowing us to be together with our brothers and sisters and coming into a house and into your place and most of all into your presence, Lord. And we just thank you for how you've been with us through this past week. We ask you, Lord, that you just continue to lead us and guide us by your word as we're going through these days of fasting and prayer. Lord, we just thank you for this opportunity to draw closer to you. We thank you for this opportunity, Lord, to examine ourselves, Lord God, giving us time now to make things right with you, Lord God. And we just love you and we thank you. We just see your love in all of this that you're doing right now in the midst of us. We ask you, Lord, you continue to be with those that are have sickness in their families and in their bodies, Lord, those that are plagued with the virus, Lord. We ask you that you continue to minister healing to them. Most of all, let them know that they are not alone and you're right there with them in the midst of them, Lord. We ask you, Lord God, as you continue just to bless those, Lord God, who have those that are not saved. We just pray for laborers, Lord God, to go forth and speak life into them, Lord, letting them know that you are the way, the truth, and the life. And Lord, we're just so grateful and excited about the service today for the word that we're coming forth from our pastors. We know it's anointed word. We thank you for the opportunity just to worship and praise you, Lord, in the midst of the believers, Lord, because you said that you are in the midst where there's two or three of us that are gathered together in your name. And we're excited about that, Lord. We're excited about what you're doing. And now, Holy Spirit, we just give this time over to you. You are the teacher. And we pray that in every classroom, Lord, you just show the word to us in a way we've never known it before, that we will hide the word in our hearts to be better service for you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Y'all have a seat. Good morning. Good morning. We're going to uh, get started. We're in lesson three this morning, talking about a destiny of kings established. We're going to talk about a few kings out of the Old Testament. Good morning. How are you? Good to see you. And lesson three is where we're starting today. <clears throat> and we concluded last week's lesson with uh, a speech from Joshua that called the Israelites to serve God. However, the conclusion to the book of Joshua indicates that the Israelites served God only until the death of Joshua and the others who had experienced God's miracles in conquering the land. The people struggled to serve God over time. Perhaps the Israelites were more focused on trusting their leaders than on their personal and national trust in God as their true leader. And, you know, we even today have to be mindful not to put our trust in man. You know, we're thankful, so thankful that we have a leader that we can trust. Good morning. Because he give us the word. But, you know, there are times, sometimes people can put too much trust in their eyes on people. And, you know, we're all subject to mess up. We're all subject to, to fall. But when you put your trust in God, when you put your trust in Jesus, he is one that would never fail, one that would never fall. So, you know, throughout the scripture, it looked like Israel, as long as they had a leader, they did good. And then sometimes when leaders changed, they would would fall and like their motives may not have been right. So, you know, it made you think, so why is it important, even if you're doing what looks right in the natural, that your motive is right? What is it about the motive? What, what's so important about having a good motive? It's your heart. It's your heart. Anybody else? That's exactly right. And that's what God always looks at is the heart. Why are you doing what you do? You know, we can come here every Sunday 
because we know it's Sunday. We know we should. But if our real motive isn't because I want to hear the word, I want to hear a word from the Lord. Or if our motive isn't because, you know, I want to come in here and worship him with my brothers and sisters. If our motive isn't right, you can go through the motions and do the right thing. But before God is empty because you're not doing it for the right reason. You're not doing it for him. You're doing it to be seen of men. So we always want to make sure our motive is, is right. So today we're going to be talking about three kings. We're talking about Saul, David, and Solomon. Good morning. We're going to be talking about Saul, David, and Solomon. And as we mentioned, for years the Israelites suffered oppression from those around them due to their disobedience to God's law. However, they thought the solution to their problem would be to have a king like other nations. In 1 Samuel 8, we learned that the root of the issue was that the people were rejecting God as their king. Now, in our text and our lesson, it jumps around a bit, but we're going to start in 1 Samuel 8, verse 4. It's not in your lesson, but I'm going to go ahead and read 5, 6, and 7, possibly 8 out of um, the New King James Version. So I'm going to read a few verses that's not in your, in your lesson. All right, 1 Samuel 8, 4. So all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. They said to him, you are old and your sons do not follow your ways. Now appoint a king to lead us such as all other nations have. And in verse 6 said, but the thing displeased Samuel when they said, give us a king to judge us. So Samuel prayed to the Lord and the Lord said to Samuel, heed the voice of the people and all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but have rejected me that I should not reign over them. According to all the works which they have done since the day that I brought them out of Egypt, even to this day, with which they have forsaken me and served other gods, so they are doing so to you also. So the people came to Samuel and said, you old, your kids ain't doing right, so we want a king. We want you to put a king over us like the other nations. And see, that was um, Israel's first problem because Israel wasn't supposed to be like other nations. They were God's chosen people. God had already given them the commandment. He had already given them the law to live by. But they wanted to be like other nations, and they wanted a king. They thought in their mind that this king would be able to help defeat the cycle of oppression that they continued found themselves under. But they found themselves under this because they continued to disobey God. That was why they was always oppressed. So Samuel, throughout the uh, chapter of, of um, chapter eight, he was trying to talk them out of it. He said, if you have a king, he's going to take your sons and he's going to make them work for the king. He's going to have them in the fields and he's going to have them uh, get in the king's harvest. He said, he's going to take your daughters and they're going to be cooks and bakers and perfume makers. He said, he's going to take a tenth of your grain. He's going to take a tenth of your, your uh, livestock. He's going to take your best servants. He was just trying to talk them out of having this my child going by the door. Um, <laughs> um, he said he was going to take, he was trying to talk them out of wanting a king because he knew that that was not initially God's best plan for them, but they still wanted to have a king. So upon um, God answered Israel's request and gave them what they wanted. The king he chose for them had the qualities they desired and the people were happy to see Saul's appointment. He was the first king. He looked like he would be a good king and God had chosen him. However, Saul still had a choice as to how he would conduct his life. So, in other words, God gave them what they asked for. They wanted a king. So God said, okay, I'm going to appoint you a king. And the way that came about was he was of the tribe of Benjamin. And then back in those days, they did what they said, cast lots. And so Benjamin was the tribe that was chosen. Then they narrowed it down to a particular clan within the, um, the tribe. And then ultimately Saul was the chosen one. Now Saul had the stature. He was a tall man. He was taller than most men at that time. It said it was like shoulder high, high above the rest of them. So in their eyes, it was like, man, you know, this guy looks good. He looks like he's a good king. But, you know, just like all of us, Saul, he had decisions to make. Even though God had truly appointed him at that time, he was still supposed to govern the land by the law, govern the land by the word that had come before him. And he didn't do it. it was, we're going to talk about that. It was a couple of times he just chose to do things his own way. And eventually that led to him being um, 
sat down from being king, if you will. But at the time that that, you know, Israel had a sense of hopefulness that Saul would be a good king due to the fact that God had indeed chose him. And so, you know, as I was reading this, it posed another question, you know, even though Saul was appointed at the time, and as we're going to see, he ended up messing up. So how can we discern a true leader, one that's anointed by God, regardless of how they look in the natural, regardless of how charismatic they may be, or how they look in appearance? How can we discern if this is a true leader? Some of the issues they support. Some of the issues they support is one. Anybody else? Right. Amen. Mm -hmm. Very good. Anybody else? I don't know if you hear what they said. Uh, CR said some of the issues they support, and then Janice said the fruit that they're bearing should be evident in their life. And you know that is so very true. The fruit is the key. You should you should see first of all if that what they're preaching, what they're saying, lines up with the Word of God, and not so much what they say as how they live. Because you know even in I think it's Matthew seven, you know people still before uh, when Jesus was talking about <clears throat> the analogy, people are gonna say, Lord, Lord, did I not? cast out demons in your name did i not do this that and the other and sometimes they have hugeonic ministries but it all goes back to what we said earlier about motive whose kingdom are you building are you building your kingdom your ministry or are you building god's kingdom god you know doing god's ministry and you know uh i think it was john bevere i heard him say i think it was him that said it you know you've been in the true presence of a man or woman of god when you leave and you want more of jesus you want more of Christ. It's not, so, oh, let me look on their website, see when they're speaking again. It's not so much them that you're running after. But they put a hunger and a thirst of righteousness in you that now you want more of God. When you've been in a true man and woman's presence, then that is usually the effect. And that's the way it should be with us. You know, he says um, in Matthew 5 that we're the salt of the earth. So what happens when you eat something salty? What do you want to do? You want water. You want to drink. And see, that's what we should do. We should have a lifestyle that, even though they might not know exactly what it is about Betty, but they know it's something, and it should create a hunger in them. To want, I want to, I want to know what Betty got. I want, why is she smiling all the time? And everything she's going through, she still has a smile. And you know, and we can give people Jesus. And then, as we do that, we can introduce him to the living water. He is the water that we can give people that never runs dry. But if we're not living a lifestyle, if our motive isn't right, if our lifestyle isn't right, then, you know, the drawing power that Jesus intends for us to walk in is not there because our motive isn't right. So, <clears throat> so Saul, he became king. He looked the part, he acted the part initially, but then he began to do some things like um, sometimes people do without any thought is like, I want to do it and I'm going to do it regardless of what anybody says. One of them was when he was supposed to wait, um, for Samuel to come back to do uh, a sacrifice. And he decided, because Samuel was going to be gone for seven days, he thought Samuel wasn't coming, so he said, so he went ahead and sacrificed himself. That wasn't his place to do that. He was supposed to wait for Samuel to do it. Then another um, uh, uh, incident was he was supposed to kill all of the Amalekites and the king. He chose not to do that, plus he let his soldiers take some of the livestock away that God had instructed him to destroy all of them. And, you know, in his mind, it's like, well, I did most of what you said, but not quite all of what you said. Well, when God tells us to do something, he wants to do all of it. <laughs> you know, it's just like I used to, um, used to hear people use this phrase called marginal deception. It's like, you know, I didn't tell a whole lie, but I just said a little bit. No, that's still a lie. <laughs> Because people call it marginal deception. Because I didn't say the whole thing wrong. I just said a little wrong. Well, in the sight of God, it's still wrong. If it's not in God, you got true and you got a lie. You know, it's either or. It's not middle of the road. Middle of the road is just like lukewarm, and you know what that what happens with that. He spews it out of, out of his mouth. So we have to be hard or cold. We have to tell the truth, or we will be standing in deception. So Saul's choice to display God disappointed Samuel because Samuel he was disappointed when when he realized that um, Saul was not following God's command, not following God's orders. But God had more for Samuel to do, which is going to lead us into our next king, which is David. 
Samuel, um, he was to anoint Israel's second king from whom the Messiah would, would descend. Samuel anointed David sometime before he came to the throne. This reminds us that God's anointing is not subject to our understanding or expectations of timing. In which we, you know, we know the story with that. Samuel went to Bethlehem to anoint one of Jesse's sons. And he had seven. So the first one comes in kind of like Saul. He looks the part, but he doesn't have a heart. So whatever rhymes. He looks the part, but he doesn't have a heart. So he, um, he looked like he might have been the next king. But God said, mm -mm, that ain't the one. So then he brings in the second one. Same thing. That's not the one. So they go through all seven, seven brothers. And then in your lesson, it says 16, 11. So he asked Jesse, this is Samuel, all these are all these the sons you have? They are still the youngest, Jesse answered. He is tending the sheep. Samuel said, send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. So Dave was out there tending the sheep. I imagine he's probably out there worshiping, you know, just in his own little world, just having, you know, time with God like he always has. And they're summoning him to come to the house because Samuel is there and he has went through all seven sons and none of them are the one. When David walks in, it says in the scripture, it says, David comes in, the Lord says, arise, anoint him, for this is the one. Now, in the natural, looking at him, you wouldn't thought he was the one. He was the shortest of the bunch. They said he's ready. Have different meanings on that. Some says he was um, he was sh short. and said he was red. So they, I guess that suggests he had red hair. He just didn't look the part. But how many of you know the Lord takes sometimes the foolish things of the world to confound the wise? He takes the ones that you would probably least expect. And that, to me, is just the awesomeness of God. He uses whoever he wants. And a lot of times, it's going to be the one that you may not think he would use. But, you know, if a person has the heart, and there again, that was the issue with David for God. He had the heart that was after God. And that was the one that he chose. And, you know, just like I said, you know, Christ was a descendant of David. The lineage was extremely important in ancient times. In the Old Testament, we see unlikely people taking on roles within God's plan. Ruth was a Moabite, Rahab a Canaanite. Both of these were Gentile women, yet they were a part of the lineage of David. And just like we were saying, you know, God uses unlikely individuals in a way that in our minds, like, you know, they ain't got the best past. Why in the world would he use them? Why do you think sometimes the Lord does that? Why does he do that? Why do you think sometimes he would use the one that in in man's eye they would probably look down like, oh, when were you using him? Why do you think the Lord used people like that? True. And I think it's also an example. It's to let people realize our God is a merciful, loving, forgiving God. The main thing is if that person, regardless of whatever kind of past they had, if they went to the Lord and repented and got in right standing with the Lord, then they qualify to be used of the Lord, regardless of what their background look, looks like. And man, unfortunately, sometimes is the one that's going to always, well, they know sometimes, they're the one that's going to hold your past against you. You know, you can do 1,500 things right. You do one thing wrong, and that is what people are going to remember you by. But our God is merciful. He said he casts your sins as far as the east is from the west. He throws them into a sea of forgiveness. And he doesn't bring them back anymore. The only way it comes back into your present is if you bring it back. Or if you allow people to bring it back. You know, I like one way I heard one pastor say, he said, you know, people always want to come and say, I remember what you did. And he said, you can look at him and say, did is past tense. So I'm not doing, I did. And I'm forgiven. And you move on and you don't let people hold your past over you. And if anything, if they want to bring it up, then you use that as a moment to testify. Yes, that was me. That was the old kind. This is the new kind. And I'm moving forward with the Lord. And, you know, you don't let people hold your past against you. And they will try to do that. So in verse 13 in our lesson, so Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. Samuel then went to Ramah. So Samuel did what he was supposed to do. He went to Bethlehem. <clears throat> he found the son that God had appointed to be the next king. He anointed him and he went on his way. And then what did David do? He went back to the field. <laughs> 
he did. He went back to the field. He was anointed king. He was anointed king in front of everybody. But he didn't go into that kingship position right then. He went back into the field. And, you know, sometimes that's a lesson for us. There are times when we know that we know that we know that the Lord has told us to do something. We know God told us to do it. You know, we feel the anointing to do it. But you let the Lord open the door. You let the Lord make the timing right. Because if he had, you know, said, okay, I'm king now. Y'all go take care of your sheep. I'm, I'm going, you know, going to the palace and I'm going to handle things. He wasn't ready. And a lot of times that's the way it happens. You know, God has a plan and a purpose for your life. But there's some growing and maturing that you have to do. You have to sit under somebody and, and be teachable and be pliable. Yes, ma'am. That's why he was under training. Mm -hmm. You know, he got to prepare you and train you. Because although you know what he has called you into, mm -hmm. you don't know what's going to go on. <laughs> That's right. And he's trying, he's trying, he's trying, he's trying to mature you and grow you up some. Mm -hmm. And he got to make you, make you a woman and make you a woman. Right. So mm -hmm. that, 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 that is not just, just, but just because you're big in body, don't mean you're big in everything else. Mm -hmm. You're so big. That's right. That's right. What's the thing in the Mm -hmm. Yes, it did. Yes. David, were you going to say something? What you were saying, uh, the anointing comes from the pressing. It comes from the excruciating crushing. Mm -hmm. And even though David was anointed by the prophet Samuel, and that anointing had to be processed mm -hmm. first. Right. So just because you're anointed doesn't always mean like you, you just mentioned it. it doesn't mean that you're in position. Mm -hmm. But the anointing is the process. Right. And so if you look on the bottles in the store and you see one that says extra virgin olive oil. It tells you it's been crushed, pulverized even more mm -hmm. than the regular oil has been. So right. it's been purified. That's what David went through in those years in the wilderness, mm -hmm. waiting for Saul to get done with his temper tantrum. Right. <laughs> waiting for God to put him in position. And God's basically showing David, David, you've got so much to learn here. Mm -hmm. You know, you have a clue. Right. And I'm not putting you in the position until <clears throat> you're ready. Mm -hmm. And I'm not taking Saul out until I'm ready. That's right. That's exactly right. And even, you know, we know uh, a lot of the things that he went through with Saul, you know, tried to kill him several times, and then David would, would get on his harp or whatever instrument it was, and he played till that spirit left him. So even in that, you know, there there was an, um, an aspect of service, like Jane was saying, that he did. And I think with um, with anything you do, whether it's, whether it's in ministry, on your job, or whatever, there's always someone that you have to submit to. There's always someone that you're going to have to be under. And if you're not willing to be under authority under anybody, then the chances are the Lord is not going to prepare you to do anything else. Because if you haven't learned submission in this level, then how can he give you greater that, you know, he can't trust you with if he can't trust you with the small? So I and, and another thing, I you know, when I think about Saul, to me, it was also training ground for him to teach him some things on what not to do. You know, a lot of times we fuss about, you know, maybe a mean supervisor or mean whatever. But, you know, even in that, you can learn from them. You can learn how not to do some things versus some things that you can learn on the good. So, and I, I feel like with every situation, it's the Lord uses, he brings teaching out of it. He doesn't waste anything that we go through. He doesn't waste any circumstance. Everything is a teaching moment if we allow the Holy Spirit to teach us in it, in the midst of it. Uh, let's see. Okay, so um, First Chronicles seventeen seven, <clears throat> which is also talking about David, it says, "Now then, tell my servant David, this is what the Lord Almighty says: I took you from the pasture, from tending the sheep, and anointed you ruler over my people Israel." And this is just where God is just reminding David where he brought him from. Like I said, he he was out there tending sheep, not around anybody other than just the animals, but God had His hand on him, had a plan for his life. And anointed him to be the next king after Saul. So as we continue to go to the next king, which is Solomon, 
Um, we know that Solomon is David's son. God did not allow David to build the temple because David had been a man of war. And we know that David, he went through making plans because he really wanted to build this big temple for God. And <clears throat> it doesn't really say anything about it in the lesson, but we know he had, he sinned before God. And then also, like I said, he was a man of war. So God would not allow David to build the temple. The temple would instead be, instead be built by David's son Solomon, who reigned in peace. And although Solomon later disobeyed God, the temple he built was a long-standing symbol of God's presence before his people. And then it just says the temple was destroyed by the armies of Nebuchadnezzar in 587 BC. Then it was rebuilt in Ezra's time. Um, let's see. David was not allowed to build the temple, but he did have the plans that he passed on to his son Solomon. And Solomon gave his, his reign well. And you know... I don't want to have a testimony. I don't want to have a testimony of I started well, then later you read, but yeah, she fell off the wagon and she missed it at the end. You know, I want to finish strong. And I know all of us do. And the only way you're going to do that is just like what Sol, um, Solomon started off. He started off asking God for wisdom about everything. And, you know, that's what we need to do. We need to always come before the Lord asking about wisdom for situations with our, with our family, with our jobs, with ourselves personally. Always be in the presence of the Lord. Stay in the presence of the Lord. Stay, keep that communication with the Lord always open. Keep your faith turned on. And see, with Solomon, he ended up, you know, marrying this woman, marrying that woman, and marrying them strange women. I used to always, well, I still tell my son, I always pray against the he ain't going to have no strange women in his life. <laughs> well, have a godly woman in his life. But he was letting them strange women come in, pulling his heart away from God. And, you know, he has the testimony, unfortunately, where he he, fought, he fell off. He, he didn't continue. With the Lord, like he started, he, he entered into sin. But in Chronicles um, 6, 1 and 11, let's look at the lesson here. Second Chronicles, the first chapter, first verse in the lesson says, Solomon, son of David, established himself firmly over his kingdom for the Lord, his God, was with him and made him exceedingly great. Then the 6, 1 said, then Solomon said, the Lord has said that he will dwell in a dark cloud, I have built a magnificent temple for, for you, a place for you to dwell forever. The Lord has kept the promise he made. I have succeeded David, my father, and now I sit on the throne of Israel, just as the Lord promised, and I have built the temple for the name of the Lord, the God of Israel. So, you know, back um, when they were in the wilderness, they, um, they had a place for, or an area, you know, they had the, um, the, um, I'm trying to say, the inner court, the outer court, the holy, yeah. holy. Thank you. The tabernacle. And they would take it up and they would move it wherever they, they moved. So when David became king, he wanted he wanted a temple. He wanted a place, a sturdy foundational place where the presence of the Lord would able to always abide. So this is why the temple was so important and why David wanted really wanted to do it. He, he didn't. It was passed on to Solomon. And as Solomon, he began to pray and began to declare about the temple, that the temple will be filled with the glory of the Lord. The reflected, this reflected God's promise to dwell with his people as he had his presence, made his presence visible in the midst of them when they were in the wilderness. So the, the goal for Solomon, even for David, was, you know, we want this place to be a place where the presence of the Lord would always abide. And that's really the way we should be today, because in First Corinthians six nineteen, it says, "Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own?" So, my question to you is: In what are some ways that you experience the presence of God, and how does His presence impact the way you live? What are some ways you experience the presence of God and how does his presence impact the way you live? We're going through this fast for these 40 days. We're praying that the glory of the Lord will fill the temple. But not just when we're together in the sanctuary, but this temple. We want the glory of the Lord to fill this temple. And, and as the word says, when godly sorrow brings repentance, this is a time that we need to be examining ourselves. We need to repent. When you're in the presence of the Lord, I don't know about you, but there's no way you get in the presence of the Lord and you not repent. <laughs> I 
because you realize how awesome holy he is and except by the blood of jesus and the grace of god we aren't worthy to come before him we're only worthy because of what jesus done and you want to make sure you examine your heart you want to make sure there's nothing you're holding against another brother or sister you want to make sure you're walking in forgiveness you don't want to be walking in bitterness you don't want to be walking in any spirit that is not of the holy spirit so you know when you're in his presence it's going to bring repentance it's going to bring that love walk that he wants us to have that love should be shining forth even more because it's by the Holy Spirit that we're able to love anyway. And without him, we can't do it. But with him, we can. So, you know, as we're going through these days of fasting and prayer, I mean, I'm I'm really believing that White Oak, not the building, but these buildings are really and truly going to be the city sitting on the hill with the light of God shining through in this dark world. This world is dark. There are so many people around us that feel like they have no hope. They feel like this is it. You know, they don't know which way to turn. But when the light and the glory of God walk into a dark place, it will draw people to them. And then we can point them to Jesus. And that's why, to me, I feel like that's why this fasting and prayer time is so awesome. And to me, it also shows the love of Christ. It is not the Lord's will that anybody would die and go to hell. He wants all people to come to repentance. Okay, so you, can you see the mercy and the love of God for us to do this during this time so you can come into his presence so you can get those things right, so you can make things right with your brothers and sisters that you have all against? To me, that's just the love of God. Like, you know, I'm coming, but I want you to come with me. So I'm giving you this time to get things right. I mean, I just, it's just, it just boggles the mind when you just see how God lines everything up. And it's all because of his love. I think, Jane, you mentioned that the other week. It's all because of the love of the Lord. He loves us so much. It is not his will that any should perish. And for those of us, you know, even sometimes myself, you know, you kind of build a little hesitant to say things to people that are going the wrong way. He's given us that boldness to go forth because you see somebody going, getting ready to go off a cliff. You're not going to just sit there and watch them go off a cliff. You're going to try to stop them. And I think that's another thing the Lord is imparting into us is the boldness that we we'll open up our mouth and we speak righteousness. Yes. You know, one thing that, that God just had to realize that, you know, as, when you're a child of God, when you walk into your workplace, that's just not your, your job. Mm-hmm. That's your assignment. Yes. And, and you can see, you know, that's why you pray, Lord, Influence, like I told you last time, influence them through me. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, a lot of times I think to pray, Lord, help me say what I need to say, but when I need to shut up, shut me up. <laughs> but, <clears throat> like, you, you can see even the people that you think would be less likely to respond mm-hmm. to you. They're gonna respond because it's not you. Mm-hmm. They're gonna they gonna they gonna see that light of Jesus Christ. Right. Because you have his blood running through your hands. Amen. That's right. The spirit is there. And you know, and we're um we have a responsibility. You know, I, I like looking at Marvel pictures like Batman, you know, and Superman and all of that. And um and Spider-Man, it said, to, um, it didn't say to who much is given, much is required, like I'm thinking in the Bible, but it, it told him that he had um, responsibility in so many words. You know, you got you got this power, and what are you going to do with it? Well, we got the power. We got the power of the Holy Spirit. What are we going to do with it? <laughs> That's right. No, we're not the high under the bushel. That's exactly right. And we have And we have words of life. That sometimes we close our mouth and we don't speak it. And I'm, I'm talking to myself. I'm stepping on my own toes right now. But we, I think sometimes we don't realize that, just like the scripture said, this, this, this um, treasure that we have in these earthen vessels. And it's time to let it come forth. You know, um, you think of a pot. We're, we're all the clay. And Jesus, Father God, is the potter. And, you know, when you think about a... Um, a pot that that breaks, you know, we discard it. We pick up all the broken pieces, throw it in the trash can. That's not what God does. He pick up all the broken pieces and put them back together. It might have a crack, but that's okay because that light that's going to shine through that crack. We're all 
crack pots. <laughs> if you think about it, <laughs> we've all had a background. We've all had, we've all had hurts. We've all had disappointments. We all had it. But the thing is, we didn't allow the enemy to let that destroy us. That's the difference. And when you see people going through stuff, you can share that. And it's okay to do that, you know. Um, and to me, that's why the Lord saves us. That's what the Lord, why the Lord brings us out. is so that we can be a witness to let somebody else know you can make it. And Jane, so much of what she was saying about assignment, because I can honestly say there was one time on my job, I want, I want the assignment. I want to go. <laughs> mm -hmm. I did not want to, you know, have to deal with some of the things that was, I had to deal with. But when I realized that and really began to pray more, it made such a difference in me that now it's like that doesn't even matter anymore. You know, I I do what I, I got to do what I got to do and I got to keep moving. Yes. When you're, when you're on your assignment, um, as God, as you see God changes people's countenance, as you see you, as you see somebody that is uh, maybe their face is drawn down, he had you to get it, to speak to them, to say certain things to them, um, lift them, lift them up, and encourage them. Mm -hmm. And you see their you see their face change. They're no longer like you know, uh, it's like they're upset off when they have a smile on their face. And but along with that. Then sometimes you don't see the roaches come out of the <laughs> And so yeah. that's when, that's when <laughs> you love your friend. That's right. <laughs> you know, you know, just it, it, you know, pray over where you go, pray over the land. Yeah. You know, bless the land where it's once is cursed. Mm -hmm. You know, have your, you know, I've done this, imagine. When I was praying, imagine myself walking through my school. That I look at into the into the classroom, into in in everywhere, mm -hmm. into the offices, and into the, even the cafeteria, the cafeteria around the, even on the playground. Kids like there you have to play with the prayer playground. Yeah, you know, pray over and and mm -hmm. just imagine yourself going through <clears> there <throat> as God leads you, as you, His Holy Spirit leads you through that. Mm -hmm. That's right. You know, That's and, exactly and right. to pray the anointing on that. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. To pray the devil's schemes will be uprooted and, and destroyed. Right. That's, That's right. That's one thing we need to be praying for this for this country. Mm-hmm. That the, the, the Satan's schemes will be uprooted. Right. The roots will be yanked out and destroyed by God. And it's going to happen, just as you said, by the church taking on that mantle of prayer and praying those things, praying through those things, and <clears throat> in case people are wondering how do we get on all of that subject we started because we was talking about the temple we was talking about being filled <laughs> we started about the temple being filled with the glory of God and um, let's see I think we finished uh, and then in verse 10 I think I read it but I'm reading it again the Lord has kept the promise he made I have succeeded David my father, and now I sit on the throne of Israel, just as the Lord promised, and I have been, built the temple for the name of the Lord, the God of Israel. This is Solomon talking. And, you know, and we can say the same thing, too. Whatever promise the Lord has made for you, he's going to keep it. The Lord is not going to owe no man nothing. If he said he's going to do something, as long as we stay in our place now, the only way that may not happen is sometimes we disqualify ourselves because we either get into sin or we become disobedient and we move ahead of God. But if we are waiting on the Lord and we're listening to his voice and we're being obedient to what he says, if he has made a promise to you, just like he did to Solomon, he's going to bring it to pass. And the last couple of verses, um, this is talking about the Queen of Sheba. The Queen of Sheba, um, she was from the kingdom of Ethiopia, and she had heard so much about Solomon's temple, about his wisdom, about the temple, about the servants, about how awesome and wonderful it looked and um she went to see it for herself because she had heard a lot about it but she wanted to experience it for herself so in the last two verses in our lesson chapter 9 verse 5 and 6 she said to the king talking about king solomon the report i heard in my own country about your achievements and your wisdom is true 
but I did not believe what they said until I came and saw with my own eyes. Indeed, not even half the greatness of your wisdom was told me. You have far exceeded the report I heard. So people around us can see the hand of God in our lives in many ways. And it just talks about the Queen of Sheba, recognize God's blessing on Solomon, both because of his wealth and his obedience to God and offering sacrifices. Likewise, people today should be able to see God in our lives through our actions, attitude, as well as our obedience to him. And that all goes back to what we had said earlier <clears throat> about our motive, about our action, about all of that, about the glory filling this temple. It, it can be seen. It can be seen. People can see it by our actions. Like I said, you can, not so much by your words, because anybody can talk or get talked, but you got to walk it out. And when I was reading this, I kind of, I was thinking, you know, especially when the last verse, it said, uh, um, I did not believe what they said until I came and saw with my own eyes. Indeed, not even half the greatness of your wisdom was told me. You far exceeded the report I heard. Now, all of us um, have this, have a testimony of being saved. But before you got saved, when somebody tried to tell you about Jesus did it really make a whole lot of sense to you? I mean, you kind of knew of it, but you really didn't know what you know now. And when I read that, that's kind of the way it is. I mean, we can tell people about it. It's like, you know, if I try to tell you how good chocolate cake is. I can tell you how good it is, how moist it is, how delicious the icing is, and the mouth style water and everything. But until you taste it yourself, words can't describe it and when i was saying that i said that's the way it is with the lord i mean we we should be able to whet people's appetite like i said because they should see just like jane and janet was saying about your lifestyle the countenance on your face you know something different about you but oh if they ever taste and see for themselves they'll realize even though you tried to explain it you can't put it into words and that's the, the re relationship the lord wants with all of us you know he he has so many blessings for us, so so much love for us that sometimes it's hard to put it into words. But until we begin to, to at least begin to speak things out to other people, begin to get the word, begin to start planting those seeds, you know, they may not know. So it is such an important lesson, um, especially, you know, we were talking about um, the temple because we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And his presence does abide in us. And the glory of the Lord is risen upon each and every one of us who bears the name of Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And we don't have to be concerned about us ourselves personally because it's not us anyway. It's him that's in, the greater one that's on the inside of us. He is the one that will do the work. He just, want a, he just wants an available vessel. That's all he wants. He'll take, I like the way the Lord put it. He said, I'll take care of everything. I just want you to be obedient. That's all he wants you to do is just be obedient. And sometimes we in our mind, we reason like, well, if I do this, then this is going to happen. What if that don't happen? What if this happened right there? And you just go and you talk yourself out of it. You know, so the best thing, and, I, and I'm guilty of that. So the best thing to do is just be obedient. Just when he tell you to do something, don't even sit around and reason on it. Just do it. <laughs> and I believe that we'll see more people coming in because, like I said, that city on the hill. We're the city on the hill. Pointing people to Jesus Christ. That's it. Thank you for this lesson. We see the difference of the kings, and we're talking about the anointing. Mm -hmm. And you notice with Saul, Saul didn't have to pay a price for the anointing. You see with David, David didn't have to pay a price for the anointing, but after he became anointed, he lost because of his sin where God forgave him. And so all of a sudden, now he recognized this anointing has a deep price. Then you see with the son who sees the kingdom and all glory of God just given everything. Mm -hmm. And he wrote the scripture that we want to be receiving this morning. And uh, in that scripture, Pastor is bringing us through. It's Proverbs 22, 22. By truth, by wisdom, by instruction and understanding, sell it not. Guess, guess what Solomon did? He 
It does come with a price, but it is well worth it. Well worth it when you're falling after the heart of God. This is a reminder for those who may have came in later. Next Sunday, we will not be up here in this room. We will be back downstairs in Hispanic Church. So look forward to seeing you there. Um, and as we close, I just want everybody to put your hand, put your hand on yourself. And we're going to close out in prayer. Father God, we just thank you so much for your word. We thank you so much for your presence. And Lord, right now in your presence, Lord, we ask you to fill these temples, Lord God. Fill these temples with all of you, Lord, all of your glory. Let your light shine forth out of these temples, Lord God. As we lay our hands on ourselves, God, we believe that you are imparted into us. We know that you already started. And I just thank you, God, that you're going to finish the work in each and every one in this room, Lord God, because we love you. We honor you and we desire more than anything that you be glorified, Lord. We give you all the praise and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. Have a blessed week. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>